So go ahead and introduce yourself and what you do for a living. Sure. I'm Natalie Bryant. I'm a sleep consultant and dream coach. So as a sleep consultant, I help people get better, more restful sleep. Um, and then as a dream coach, I use dreams as tools for uh, self-discovery and growth. That's awesome. All right. So we're going to go through a list of questions and then we're going to get some uh, recommendations from you and then we're going to get into uh, audience Q&A and then we'll let you go on your merry way. Um, but we're going to start now from the very beginning. So tell us about your childhood, where you grew up, your family, siblings, anything like that. So all the way back. Okay. Yeah, way back. Um, so I am from, wait for it, normal Illinois. Oh, wow. Yes, that's a place. And no, I'm not kidding. Um, and it is exactly what it sounds like. Um, to answer the question on everybody's mind, it was painfully normal. Um, so that's probably why I became so interested in kind of like uh, altered states of consciousness, <laughs> such as dreams um, and, uh, you know, in sleep and um, these different things, because um, there really wasn't that much to do when you're surrounded by cornfields. Um, but, uh, you know, I was also really interested in um, this idea of, you know, nature versus nurture. So for your viewership, uh, nature was is this idea that you know, um, it's, it's kind of like a false dichotomy uh, where you have, um, uh, or, or a debate where you have the nature side where it's, um, you know, mechanical and we're kind of born with the circuitry and, you know, the uh, environment has very little to do with shaping a human being and their personality. And then all the way on the other end of that, you have the nurture side where, uh, you know, it's all, you come into this, this world as a blank slate and it's all, um, you know, experience that shapes you. Um, and so, of course, now we know that it's neither, it's not one or the other. And epigenetics has shown that it's kind of this complex interplay. Um, but I remember as a kid just being fascinated with this idea that, um, and, and it was so obvious to me that your experiences shape who you are. Um, I could actually see um, some of the things that happened to me as a child, um, changing the way that I responded to my environment as I got older and older and older. So I became very interested in, in this, this idea. And then um, it, it made sense when I went in to study memory, because that's essentially what we have as memories for our experiences. Um, so I was kind of a dreamy kid, you know, I was in my head a lot. Um, but I was also the kind of kid who was really um, outspoken, um, very affectionate, like uh, very interested in other people and like wanting to know what made them tick. Um, I was also kind of a ham, uh, really wanted to, to, you know, ham it up for people. Um, I often joke that uh, if we had YouTube when I was six years old, I would have been one of those like six-year-old influencers, you know, because I just love being in front of the camera. Um, so, you know, so that's kind of where I, where I came from. And, uh, but yeah, I was very fascinated in, in what made people tick um, and what made myself tick, you know, there was kind of, maybe I was a little self-involved. Um, but ultimately I was just very interested in like interpersonal relationships and the way that um, the environment can shape a human being. Wow. So do you have any brothers, sisters? Yeah, um, I was uh, kind of the middle child. I have an older sister, um, biological sister. Uh, she's uh, four and a half years older than me. We have a great relationship. I also have two stepbrothers, um, one older and one younger, also great relationships. Um, so I was I was definitely the weird one <laughs> out, of, out of the group. Um, definitely, uh, like I said, the the um, the dreamer of the crew. Um, but it was, it was kind of fun growing up and having, um, you know, my brothers came into my life a little bit later. Um, I was about seven years old. So for a long time, it was just me and my sister. Um, and we built uh, a really strong bond. And then to be able to, you know, share that bond with two brothers, um, was really, uh, it was very interesting 
going from living with all girls to suddenly there are these <laughs> disgusting creatures in my house. <laughs> I completely but it was fun. Understand. Yeah, I completely <laughs> understand. So tell me, uh, like, what were you like in high school? Well, let's see. You were, know, you, were you the party first, study later, or found like a, a combination of the two? Like, it's funny. Well, like, I would say like most that, of the scientist um, friends that I know always were like, they had this nice balance of going to parties and also making good grades. It was pretty fascinating. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I didn't party that much in high school. I think that kind of came more um, in college. <laughs> uh, and that was, yeah, that was... When I discovered that balance, oh man, I was unstoppable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, I was a psychologist, so I was it was research, right? You know, all of these like interpersonal interactions. I was doing my research. No, as a as a high school kid, you know, something happens where that kid that was, you know, that six year old that was like standing on the chair at Payless and singing, you know, the theme song to Annie and didn't care who heard her, you know, and drawing a crowd. Um, something happens in the socialization process where, you know, you're not, uh, that kind of behavior um, isn't rewarded uh, so much when you're um, kind of going into like junior high and high school. It's much more like fit in those like differences that made you cool and interesting and, you know, got you a lot of attention from your family and from your parents. Those are the kinds of things that you get bullied for um, later on. And so um, I kind of uh, uh, experienced a shift in um, the way that I related to people. I was much more of, um, of a wallflower. I was very self-conscious, but there was this part of me that was just dying to stand out. Um, so of course I became like one of those grungy, punky hippies. Um, because that was the best way that I knew how to be anti, you know, establishment, but also stand out in, in a way, you know, and not be just one of the, the sheeple. Um, so, you know, uh, lots of grungy clothes, lots of patchwork. Um, <laughs> the dreadlocks didn't come until later. Dreadlocks didn't come until, uh, until I college. I totally with dreadlocks. Oh yeah, my hair took right to dreadlocks. Are you kidding me? I basically just rolled out of bed and was like, I am not doing this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so when were you actually, like your first memory of being like, okay, psychology is something that is gonna be big in my life in the future? Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, I remember taking a, a a psychology class maybe my it must have been my junior year of high school and uh, I found it to be just absolutely fascinating it was like there's no question you know this is what I'm going to do um and uh I think that it was probably it wasn't until um I had graduated from um undergrad with my degree in psychology uh, that I realized that I wanted to study sleep and dreams. Now, I always kept, like as a child, I should mention that I always kept a dream journal. You know, I was very, very interested in my dreams. Um, and, uh, you know, this idea that we, we spend a third of our lives asleep, and yet we just kind of take it for granted, like breathing, you know, and we don't really understand uh, why we sleep, what's going on during sleep. Um, and so it just made sense for me to, um, to make that transition after I got my degree in psychology. It was, I, actually it was a, a podcast, um, Radio Lab, uh, a, an episode that they had on sleep. I wanna say it's in the first, um, it's, it's kind of earlier um, in the series. And uh, it was, they were describing a study done by um, Bob Stickgold, who is at um, Harvard Medical School. And he's one of the premier researchers on uh, dreams. And he talked about this uh, incredible study that he got on the cover of Science for, which is he basically had people play Tetris before they went to sleep and then woke them up and asked them what they were dreaming about. What do you think they were dreaming about? Tetris. Russia? <laughs> they were dreaming about Tetris and everybody oh. has had this 
experience. <laughs> well, then, then where... I would have been way off because, like, when I hear Tetris, <laughs> I think of Russia. It's probably because of the the, stuff the music. In the background. Yeah. And actually, there was probably people. What he found was that there are probably people who were dreaming of of that because they would dream of of you know tetris and like the blocks and like sometimes it was really spot on but your dreams aren't like that dreams aren't you know a a, a what we call veridical or just like one-to-one -one replay of what happened to you during the day then dreams would be really boring no it's a combination it's an amalgamation of what happened to you during the day and maybe some of your past experiences and then there's this like uh, generalization and abstraction process that happens and that's what he ended up finding was some people you know he would wake them up and they would say yeah I was dreaming of Russia and there were these um, you know there were these uh, uh, buildings that were in the shape of you know these like Tetris shapes you know and so it really combined with their their knowledge about the world um, and so when I heard that study I said hold on a, I didn't realize that you could study dreams. Like that wasn't me. I didn't even know that was a thing. And two, I didn't know that you could get on the cover of science for that. So it just became absolutely, you know, 100% what I was going to devote my life to at that point. That's awesome. So where did you do your undergrad? Undergrad, um, I did at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Um, it's a small town um, at the southern tip of Illinois. Um, it's a party school, to answer <laughs> your previous question. Um, uh, it was like uh, rated, you know, number two party school just under UCLA the year that I went. Um, but I managed to, you know, I managed to stick with it. Didn't party too hard. Graduated uh, magna cum laude. Wow. So. Awesome. Um so you mentioned like like let's get more personal so yourself uh when did you say you got dreads oh that was uh that was my freshman or sophomore year of high school of college of, of college all right so mm -hmm. what was that transition like because i know when i talk to a lot of kids who are going off to college now um, especially that have been sheltered or in a small town, um, you see, you almost see the mind being blown of, of dealing with all the freedom that they have. So what was that like for you to go from a place like with cornfields, like I'm, I'm saying I came from a small town in, in the country. So what was it like for you to, to make that transition to a, a bigger school? So the, um, I, it's actually a smaller town, Carbondale, than the one that I grew up in, believe it or not. Um, uh, Normal shares, it's a twin city, also Bloomington, uh, which is where uh, State Farm Insurance, that's like our biggest, that's like our claim to fame. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it was a huge transition for me um, going from, you know, being under my parents' roof to suddenly having all of this, um, this freedom. Uh, now the dreads weren't a rebellion in any way. It was actually just like, I'm sick and tired of dealing with my hair, but it just so happened to fit in nicely with my aesthetic. So, um, so that was really good. Um, you know, I think that there's there's a, a sense of balance that everybody has to come to, um, and it and it comes at different times for different people. For me, uh, it it didn't. I don't think that that sense of balance really happened until very recently. Um, I was uh, the kind of person who, because I loved being around people so much, um, I I really craved the party scene. But because I was also teased mercilessly in grade in grade school that, you know, made me feel much more introverted. Um, I needed uh, the help of like alcohol um, in order to, you know, kind of smooth that transition. So, um, you know, naturally, I think what happens with a lot of kids is that they're, they're just in awe of all the freedom that they have. And it's very easy, especially if you're in an environment like a party school environment um, where that's ex not only accepted, but it's kind of expected of you. Um, I didn't let it uh, interfere with my, um, my studies though, uh, because I also knew my limits. So for instance, I never signed up for classes before 10 a.m. 
like that is just not going to happen. Uh, you know, so you, so you make it work. <laughs> you make it work. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's good to, to, you know, reiterate the fact that you, you, with all that new gained freedom that you, you still have to be rooted into why you're at this place in the first, you know, exactly in the first place. And, and I made that mistake, uh, my first go round <laughs> when, when I met Dr. J, but, um, all right, moving on. So, uh, let's go over some obstacles, whether you had, uh, academically or, um, or personally throughout your education experience up until, um, uh, your, your, um, your graduate degree and doctorate degree. Like, did you have anything major that came up that you struggled with? You know, in undergrad, I, I feel like, you know, I see these memes of like, of, of, you know, kids lamenting about how hard college is. And I didn't have that experience at all. Um, I found college to be pretty much a breeze. Um, I didn't really, I, I was so spoiled. It was mostly, um, you know, the, uh, the, balancing um my party life with my with my work life uh because you know that that was like my main i mean that's that sounds so privileged and i just want to own that because that was like my primary issue uh and then you know it wasn't until after i you know when i graduated and i had to enter into the real world um that i really struggled um, I think what that looked like, because I, I wouldn't say that my education, my undergraduate education finished when I graduated. Um, in fact, you know, we're, we're encouraged uh, to choose a major at a very young age, like before our frontal lobe is even developed, you know, and I got lucky because I chose something that was true to me. I didn't know what I wanted to do with it yet. Um, when you get a degree in psychology, you have two different paths. The first one is, you know, you can do research, you can become an experimental psychologist, um, and then you're on the tenure track, you're doing a professorship thing like Jay's doing, um, or you can go the clinical route, you know, and work with patients and become a therapist. Um, I thought that that was the route that I wanted to do. So after graduating, um, I got a job as a substance abuse counselor. Now I was 23 years old and I myself had my own problems with substance abuse. I was dating somebody with problems uh, with substance abuse. And um, so to uh, enter into that situation, I thought it was gonna be a great resume builder. Um, and you know, it has been. Uh, but it was, um, I hadn't learned boundaries yet. Uh, and that's very important when you're dealing with a client or a patient. Um, you don't want to take on their stuff as your own. And also these people are in pain, they're suffering. Um, so, you know, if, if they're, uh, and, and some people are, uh, want to blame you or, you know, uh, project some of that suffering onto you. And if you're a 23 year old, you know, kid, uh, with barely um, any training, no training in um, how, you know, in counseling. Um, my, I had just a basic, you know, understanding of psychology. Uh, that, and you're doing a job that is um, not true to who you are. I had the mask that I wore, you know, when I was drinking a glass of wine with my friends. And then I had the mask that I wore when I was telling you know, my students, th these were high school students, when I was telling my students not to do that. And what that created in me was a division that was so uncomfortable. Um, it's cognitive dissonance. If you know, you probably know what that is. It's like basically when you're living something that isn't in alignment with your truth and something's got to give. And I did it for about a year and a half um, until I um, it was actually the external situation forced me out of it. Um, and luckily so. I mean, I'm so, so grateful that it got so hard that it was now impossible to do. And the only option was to leave that job. Um, and once I left that job, uh, I, I, you know, moved back home, picking up the pieces, decided to get a research gig. And, um, and uh, that was um, that was pretty dry, but I was so terrified from what I had experienced, you know, uh, as a counselor 
um, that I said, you know, clinical psychology is just not for me. I'm never going to do that. Um, and so that's why I went the experimental route when I ended up going to graduate school. Um, but now that I've, you know, been through the ringer, so to speak, um, I see that, you know, that was a function of being undertrained and not aligning with my truth. Um, and my truth at that time was that I, I, I was having a very superficial experience in this world. Um, and I was really craving deep connection with people, but I just didn't know how to go about it. Um, and so that's actually uh, fascinating that I, I'm, now that we're talking about it, I'm realizing like that's what I do in my coaching is I find people who are in these situations where, you know, they've got a job and the money's good, right? but it's not what they're meant to do. And that's a sickening feeling. Um, and when I came out of that situation, I mean, it was no more than a year later, I developed an autoimmune disease. Um, and so that would, would be, I would say, you know, one of the primary uh, um, difficulties that I had in my education was balancing, um, so I had celiac disease um, and I, and I didn't know how to manage my disease. You know, it's not as easy as cutting out gluten. Um, it's much more complicated than that. And also food is a way to connect to people. And so, uh, you know, the body really is a symbol for, for what's going on in the mind. And I did not have strong boundaries. And my gut then reflected that and did not have strong boundaries. And so, you know, there was this called leaky gut syndrome, which is a precursor to celiac disease when, you know, the body just starts attacking itself whenever it's in, you know, in the face of a threat, right? Um, and, uh, and a lot of, you know, it's my fault, you know, there's, it's, it's so symbolic. Um, so, so that was a huge um, uh, barrier for me um, in, in graduate school was learning, you know, in, in undergrad, it was learning to balance my party life and my school. And now it's learning to balance my disease and my school and self-care and my, and my schooling and my work, uh, which is such a wonderful lesson. And I'm, I would never, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't want to do anything differently because it just, it taught me so much about myself. Um, but it was hard. It's, it's really, really hard when you're brain is inflamed and you, you can't think and you're, you know, trying to um, uh, interact, trying to interact with people and learn very, very complex, um, difficult topics. Um, and then, you know, you have the exact imposter syndrome that I had as a, as a counselor is now just being repeated in, um, in, in my schooling and in, in graduate school. And that happens with everybody, but, um, you know, it's, it's just really interesting. It, it just really speaks to this idea that we think that if we change the environment, if we change the outside, if we change what's happening out here, oh, okay, now I'll be happy. But no, all of these things function to just kind of trigger us over and over and over again. Um, so huge learning experience, um, being sick and having to just muscle through uh, it really does make you feel like a superhero at the end of the day. <laughs> so, so there's, there's I didn't that. know you had celiac. Yeah, and that seems to be a, a an uptick. Uh, I'm seeing that a, a lot now. Like the um, the person that teaches me martial arts also has it as well, and I found that out. I was like, wow. And then I think my aunt has it as well. So it's it's mm -hmm. weird. I'm starting to see it pop up more and more. But I get what yeah. you're saying about changing the outside. It, the way I think of it, it's like painting a house. You know, it's it's still got that crappy interior I and mean, it might be nice, you know, for other people walking by, but you still have to sleep in it, you know, like, um, mm. but uh, all right. Well, uh, so are you managed to uh, the celiac things? It's all managed now. You're doing really well. Yeah, it is. And I, I want to say something about that painting a house thing, because, you know, the house symbol in the dream you know, that was, uh, that was Jung, Carl Jung's symbol for the psyche, the mind, the life. And so when you said that, it was like, yes, I remember at that time having a lot of house dreams where I was like in my house and it was just grody. There were a lot of people in there that I didn't even know and I didn't like, you know, and, um, and I, I remember, you know, in hindsight, looking back, it was like my house, my life, my psyche, my brain. My mind wasn't someplace that I wanted to be. And 
I thought, you know, that I could change the external circumstances, but you got to come home and the person that you're coming home to is you. And so not that, and, and then the beauty of it is, and this is actually to your point, to your question, um, is am I uh, managing my celiac disease? Once I realize that, you know, the person I'm coming home to is myself and I better, I better build a relationship with her. I better become friends with her. My celiac disease became like super manageable. Um, and it was, it was really amazing to watch. Um, in the first, uh, you know, year of graduate school, that was when I was diagnosed. Um, I would have like a crumb, uh, you know, or, or cross contamination. Somebody would put a fork on some something containing wheat, and then I would use that fork. Very very small amount, and I would be down for the count for two weeks. Um, and a lot of that was because, yeah, there was pain there, but there was the suffering on top of the pain, you know, that was making my life unlivable. It was like living in, like my, my consciousness was sandpaper, you know, it was like really the only way that I can describe it. Um, and then once I started um, really uh, coming, you know, feeling at home in myself and uh, building a friendship, a really falling in love with myself, um, all of those symptoms became just so much easier to deal with. And it's because I had learned uh, self-compassion. So it really, um, you're right, there is an uptick in the incidences of celiac disease and gluten intolerance. And I think that that's um, you know, uh, an issue of, uh, there, there, there are a lot of different reasons why that is. Um, and doctors, unfortunately, are you know, just prescribing a gluten-free diet and not much else with it. Maybe a, a, you know, a cursory, hey, also manage your stress, right? Um, but I think one of the things that we need to be teaching people um, with any sort of disease, but especially an autoimmune disease, is self-compassion. Because that is the best way that you can deal with these, these types of symptoms. And the fact that it's an autoimmune disease tells me that there's something happening in here where there may be some you know, attacking of the self. So learning self-compassion is, is just absolutely crucial you know, to, to overcoming those kinds of hardships. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, all right, so let's move on. Let's see. Uh, so you worked as a counselor. Was that before you started graduate school? That's right. So, so take me on that journey from uh, graduate and uh, up until like how and what the process was like to get your your PhD. So I was working um, at. I was a data manager um, working for a publication company. Um, you know, and uh, just back in my hometown, looking at those cornfields again and thinking to myself, you know, uh, I have dreams and I have, uh, I have, you know, uh, stuff that I want to um, explore. And then I heard that podcast and said, you know, sleep, sleep is it. Sleep is what I have to devote my life to. Um, and I found the, um, one of the best sleep labs in the country. Um, and I applied and I have no idea how, but I managed to get in. I look at, you know, the people who came before me and the people who came after me. And I'm like, if I would have come, you know, a year before or a year later, I'm not sure if I would have gotten in because, you know, the competition was so fierce. Um, but they saw something in me and, uh, and I, I was accepted into um, the University of Arizona. Um, I had three advisors um, and I totally recommend if you are a, a graduate student and you're looking into programs, look for a collaborative program. Uh, like the ones that they have, um, like the one that they have at the University of Arizona, um, you have one advisor, but you, you know, you're, you're shared between many. And so if, you know, heaven forbid, if anything happens, you know, a relationship, uh, you know, quarrel between you and your primary advisor, then you have other people that you can get support from. Um, but for me, it was really a team effort. We had, you know, three of the best minds um, on the topic that I wanted to study. And I just got to just, you know, sit there and just like soak it in. Um, so my primary advisor was Rebecca Gomez. She's an incredible memory researcher and developmentalist. Um, and uh, and she's, she was really like the um, 
we, we called her like the mother hen, you know, she really um, held my hand through. Um, I cried so many times in her office. She always had tissue for me. Um, she was very, very supportive, but she also pushed me um, and made me feel safe to kind of, you know, move forward. Um, Lynn Nadell, who, um, you know, he's based, he's the guy who wrote the book on the hippocampus. Um, hippocampus is a cognitive map. Um, he's the person who um, he and John O'Keefe uh, discovered place cells in um, the rat hippocampus. Uh, and so um, he really was the, you know, the dreamer and, you know, pushed me like, if dreams are what you want to study, you know, let's do dreams. Like you should do what, what it is that you want to do. All right. So he was the person, he was the, you know, um, the person who allowed me to dream big. Um, and then the late Dick Bootson, um, we unfortunately lost him in 2015. That was really hard. Speaking of challenges throughout graduate school, losing an advisor is definitely up there, top. Um, but he was, um, uh, and still is obviously, you know, a, a pillar in the sleep community. He is um, the person who developed, if you've ever heard the stimulus control rules for insomnia, um, you know, only use your bed for sleep and sex, um, you know, go to bed and wake up at the same time, you know, no eating in bed, um, those, those rules, that was him. He developed those rules. Um, so he uh, really um, made a huge, huge impact on the field. Uh, so me, Amongst all these wonderful, amazing minds, um, I was, I, I, I was floored. I was absolutely floored. Um, just prior to this, I do want to mention I also did a um, an assistantship um, with Mary Kerskadden, who is like the um, you know the big wig, the head of uh, the research around. Um, early school start times and how this is really destroying um, uh, teenagers um, and, and prepubescent kids' um, ability to learn because they're waking up way too early and they're not able to function. She's the person who pioneered the research showing that um, not only do teenagers need to go to bed and wake up later, um, but they also need to sleep longer. So when you're sitting here saying my teenager is so lazy, all he wants to do is sleep all the time. It's because there's a biological drive to do that. So I got to be part of that research um, and help them collect that data. So, mm. uh, so that was, it was a whirlwind of going from the starry eyed, I just, I just want to study sleep. You know, I've got my undergraduate education in, in psychology um, to, all right, let's go work with, you know, the absolute, you know, pioneers of this field. That's absolutely incredible. So what was, what did you do your thesis on your dissertation and, and uh, how did you come about uh, get going that route? Um, so my, uh, when I first arrived, I was, you know, fresh out of this assistantship that I did with Dr. Kerskadden, um, where, you know, I was, I was fascinated, and I've always been fascinated with adolescents. That was the age group that I worked with as a counselor. Um, I love that time because they're coming into their adult minds, but they're still very childlike. Um, they're entering a, a time of, you know, like, uh, their brain is like neuroscientific calibration point, right? Where they're learning so much um, and it's really um, shaping who they become as adults. So I wanted so badly to continue the research that, um, that Mary was doing at Brown um, with adolescents. Um, so I did a, a circadian study where I um, monitored uh, um, teenagers' cortisol levels um, across the day, um, across the week, excuse me, where um, I looked at um, the uh, sleep that they um, uh, had on the weekends and compared it to the sleep that they had um, during the week. And the idea is, you know, teenagers sleep in on the weekends to try and catch up and sleep at a time that's like normal given their uh, circadian rhythm. Um, but then they have to effectively, uh, you know, shift their sleep schedule back to the normal um, functioning sleep schedule of the early school start time. So they become jet lagged. 
And that's what we found um, in their cortisol levels is that the kids who did not adjust well and who felt like garbage the following week, they basically had blunted cortisol, meaning that their cortisol was elevated, right? Which makes sense because, you know, that's a, a compensatory mechanism. It helps them feel more awake. Um, but they didn't have that nice little bump that you usually get in the morning that like helps you to wake up. We have a nice little bump of cortisol in the morning. They didn't really have that. So it was just blunted. It was just basically a straight line. So it's no wonder these kids are suffering. Hmm. Um, now, research in children is actually very difficult to get funded. Um, and we were uh, dealing with um, you know, a funding crisis at the NIH and uh, it just became too difficult to carry on that research. So I shifted a little bit to what I, you know, actually really wanted to do, which is sleep and memory. Um, and so our brains are very, very active when we're asleep. Um, we're taking information that we encountered during the day and we're integrating that information into our current worldview. And through that integration process, we actually start to change our worldview to fit the new information. So um, if you had a glimpse into this process, then you would be able to see how your brain effectively creates reality itself. Right. So the research that I did um, for my dissertation was looking at how memories change over time. Um, we teach people, uh, uh, you know, uh, two um, learning paradigms um, over, uh, I want to say it's like three days. Um, and we reactivate the first memory in during the second learning experience. And then we teach them something new. OK, so. What happens is that new information becomes integrated into the old memory. And we know that this happens anecdotally, but that's not been really reflected so much in the memory research until very recently. We kind of thought that, you know, memories are consolidated and then that's it, right? You can't change them after that. Well, this shows that you can, in fact, reactivate a memory, return it to a labile state, and then change it, and then reconsolidate that memory. And so my dissertation looked at this paradigm and the role that sleep plays in this paradigm and found that um, uh, events in the sleep EEG called sleep spindles, um, that's during uh, stage two sleep, they look like little footballs, they're bursts of activity, um, you know, and, the, uh, and it takes about, you know, they can, about a half a second to two seconds long uh, spindles in the EEG. Um, and these uh, were associated with the extent to which people's memories changed as a function of that reactivation process. Um, so the idea is that not only does sleep support, you know, we know that sleep supports memory consolidation. We've already seen that. Um, but this showed that sleep supports uh, memories changing over time, and specifically these events, which have been also tied to other memory processes like integration um, of memories over time, that those um, were related to um, the memory integration process that we were trying to show. Um, so it all kind of uh, comes down to this idea that, you know, uh, our representation of the world isn't fixed, it's changeable. And, um, and, and, the, and sleep plays a very, very important role um, in the way that we change these memories. And so if we've been able to observe that process you know, in a study, imagine if you could observe that happening within yourself. And that's what dreams do, is it gives you a window into the process by which we you know, take these new memories and then integrate them into our existing knowledge structure. That's that's uh, amazing. I actually have a question for you too. So, okay. dreams are you, you said the day you're taking things that have happened through throughout the day, and it's um, your brain is making sense of it and form you know consolidating it into a memory and then putting it away. Um, but in the in the process of doing that, does does it like you said it accesses because sometimes I'll have, you know, people have dreams and it'll be something that happened weeks ago, but it's integrated in with something they, they did 
that day you know you know what i'm saying like um is that what you're saying how it can change memories yeah so if you think about your experiences um as uh you know over time okay let me start from here when you first create a memory it's very very detailed right um and so if you were to uh look at a page um with maybe a photo on it or something like that and then close your eyes and try to recall your memory is going to be much better for um, those details immediately or after a night of sleep than it will be a week you know a, a week later and this is because of the nature of the hippocampus this is our um uh uh, the part of our brain that allows us to code those details specifically um, with concern to spatial contextual details. So the details in your environment. Um, so this can be, you know, uh, a dresser and, you know, what this person is wearing and the time of day, right? So these are a lot of details. Well, over time, those details aren't really necessary for the memory. Um, you probably know that Paris is the capital of France, but do you remember the details of when you learned that? No, you lost those details because they were deemed not important. Um, and so this is a, an active forgetting process. The brain, you know, kind of sheds away uh, the things that it doesn't need. It decontextualizes the things um, that are deemed unimportant. Um, and this actually is a process that happens during sleep as well. Um, and you're left with the knowledge, okay? And we call this um, semant semanticization. So you have a detailed episode, uh, an experience with a lot of details um, and information in it. And then over time that the information kind of just gets shed pruned away. And then you're left with uh, um, just the information itself, a semantic memory, okay? So this is, you know, uh, categories. This would be facts, um, like Paris is the capital of France. Um, so what's happening when you're having a dream that you know you might uh, have something that happened like a few weeks ago and is now being integrated with something that happened yesterday? It's you're basically getting a glimpse into this process by which those details that are deemed unimportant are shed away, and then the stuff that is important becomes reactivated. It's not just one time that it's reactivated; it's reactivated basically for the rest of your life. But what's interesting is that, um, you know, if something happened to you during in the day, um, you know, just yesterday, it maybe um, reminds you of something that happened a week ago. So this is the overlapping nature with which those memories are stored. Um, so if you have, you know, a couch, you know, a memory of a couch or something like that, it may um, activate, you know, your memory for going to Copenhagen last week or something like that. So you can follow the breadcrumbs, so to speak. Um, and with this, um, you know, I'm using a very dry example, but you can see how this would become uh, really uh, therapeutic in a way. Um, if something happens to you yesterday that reminded you of something that happened to you in childhood, then those two things are going to co-occur in a dream. And that's an indication hey, this is really important to me. Maybe there's some healing that needs to be done around that, right? Because dreams are essentially the way that our mind creates meaning from all this data that's coming in. And it's organizing it in a way that makes sense and is efficient and overlapping. And that's how we as humans experience meaning. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. Um, all right, so... Uh, who do you think had the most impact on you uh, while you were getting education all the way from elementary to grad school? Um, I would have to say I had, um, I would have to say my sister. Uh, she was my big sister. Oh, I wanted to be just like her. I wanted to be just like her. Um, you know, she went to med school she became a doctor and I wanted to be a doctor. Um, not that kind of doctor because I didn't want to go to med school and I couldn't have gotten in. Um, it's incredibly competitive. Uh, but, you know, I, I, uh, 
when I was applying, um, well, she, she was actually the person who suggested that I go to um, the undergrad that I went to because she was like, you need to be around people, you know, you need to get out of our hometown, you need to experience, you know, the world, which was, you know, Carbondale, Illinois to us at the time. Um, but, you know, she, she really encouraged me to uh, um, push my limits in that way. Um, I think she understood the um, tremendous uh, power that she had over me or, you know, um, influence, I should say, that she had. Um, so she used that to her advantage, to, to, to my advantage, and really um, encouraged me to step outside of my comfort zone and try new things. Um, and then she also uh, really supported me through graduate school, um, th through the application process, because I had never done anything like that. Um, if you are a first generation student like she was, you're doing this all, you know, without anybody helping you. There are resources on campus and you can find a mentor. Um, but it was amazing to have somebody who'd been through it before um, and could help me uh, sort of uh, build my application and get organized and feel like I had some sort of um, you know, empowerment in a situation that was terrifying for me. So, so I would say that my sister was a huge influence in that way. Um, I also had and continue to have extremely supportive parents. Um, when everything was falling apart, you know, I always had a place to come home to. Um, so, so that was uh, absolutely tremendous. Um, and then in graduate school, um, I would have to say the main thing that I, you know, the biggest piece of advice that I give people besides finding a collaborative environment, um, make sure that you have a good relationship with your advisors because it's a marriage. You know, you're going to live the rest of your life with this person on it, you know, if, if it works out well. But, you know, at the very least, you're spending the next five years of your life with this person. You need to make sure that you get along with them and that you feel supported by them. And I had not only one supportive uh, advisor, but I had three. Um, I look around at some of the uh, students in my cohort and beyond who they didn't have the same support that I did. And the thing is that graduate school sucks. Like it sucks really, really bad. Um, and there are times where you are just like, why did I do this? This is a horrible idea. Nobody wants me here. They're all just faking it. They see something in me that isn't real and everybody's just gonna wake up to the fact that I'm an imposter. I don't care who you are. If you're in graduate school, you will have that experience. Um, and you know, you need somebody who's gonna just say, hey, this is normal kind of, you know, walk you down from the from the ledge, so to speak, and say, you know, I understand that you're upset, um, you know, but it, it's, it gets easier, just stick with it, and can give you resources. Also, keep in mind that I was severely sleep deprived, uh, because I was running all of my own sleep studies. Um, so, you know, so that that gets really tough, too. But uh, they also understood the importance of sleep. So, you know, I remember one time crying in uh, Rebecca Gomez's office and, and she said, were you up all night? I think you just need to go home and get some sleep because I was just so overly emotional. Um, so find advisors like that. It's, it's absolutely critical that you feel both supported and like they're, you know, really pushing you like my sister did, pushing you outside of your comfort zone. Um, because you know you it's it's a terrifying experience and if you have that support um, it makes all the difference awesome so uh what do you th what work are you most proud of in your career so far you know i would have to say um the thing that i'm most proud of that i've done so far was write my dissertation and i'm going to tell you why um i was so sick I was so sick. Um, if you have an autoimmune disease, you know, they tell you to manage your stress as if that's, you know, just something that you can, like a pill that you can take, my stress management, you know, and then you never have a, a, a flare up ever again. Um, but it's not that easy. And um, 
no amount of, <laughs> of mindfulness, it seemed like, uh, was was really getting at the heart of what I was what I was experiencing. Um, and also, there's this issue of not being in control um, that was very difficult for me as well. Um, I was doing everything that I knew how to do in terms of keeping myself healthy, managing my stress. I was meditating at the time um, and, you know, staying away from foods that made me sick and just trying to manage my inflammation at that point. But something happened that triggered my, my whole system. And for the like last push, the last three months that I was writing up my dissertation, I was probably the sickest I'd been, you know, since before I was diagnosed, right? So I was getting like consistently glutened over and over and over again and didn't know what was going on. And my brain was so inflamed that I didn't know where I was half the time. I was in hospitals. Um, and then, you know, this experience was feeling like that sick. Um, but then also having to write, you know, a hundred page dissertation. Um, so when I look back on that, um, I really, uh, you know, I can do anything at this point. Like if I did that, like I am unstoppable. Like I am, I am a superhero. If I can, if I can do that while sick, like nothing is going to stop me. Absolutely. Um, all right. So what are your plans for the future? What, what's, what's gonna, what are you, where are you trying to go from here? So I, um, after graduating with my degree, um, in experimental psychology, I did the postdoc thing for a while and I realized that my heart was back in, you know, helping people. Um, and you can do that to some extent as a researcher, um, and, but you're doing it on like a global scale. It's, it's, it's kind of depersonalized. Um, and, and some people like that, you know, so, some people that's a really good fit for them. But for me, I needed to, you know, be working with people directly. Um, and I'd also had a, sort of an awakening, you know, throughout this process of, of graduate school and dealing with my disease. Um, that, and dreams played a huge role in that because I was using my dreams um, to help me understand myself and why I was, I kept having like the same uh, um behavioral triggers over and over and over again. And like, how can I learn from this and move forward? Um, and, and what I realized was, you know, the, this issue of, you know, self-compassion and self-healing and self-discovery is accessible to everyone, but so few people understand it. We're given these gifts every single night. We're given these tools, these windows into our unconscious that can give us clues into who we really are, what we really want, what we value, and how we can move forward with our lives instead of just kind of being in the same, you know, press the lever and get a pallet of food um, behavior patterns. We can evolve past that, and dreams are a tool into this. Um, and so it just made sense for me to go the coaching route and actually start to take on clients. And I really just wanted to share with them what I've learned about dreams as medicine, um, as, as, uh, as tools for self-discovery. So, um, so all this to say, you know, I, I launched my business. Um, I did a soft launch last year. Um, and then I uh, uh, started, you know, really taking it seriously and taking on clients um, earlier this year. And it's just been a tremendous success. It's amazing um, how much this idea resonates with people. Um, and I think it's because dreams are so personally meaningful. And even just having a person there to, to help you kind of work through it is extremely therapeutic. Um, so, so my dreams for the future is I would really love to get together a group of people and do kind of a mastermind, uh, maybe a workshop, um, and, sh and teach people how they can use their dreams as tools for self-discovery and growth. Um, and, and kind of, uh, shifting the conversation away from this fluffy, and, and there's nothing wrong with this, but uh, some of the, the dream work out there tends to be a little bit, um, uh, you know, 
um, I have to be careful what I say here because I don't want to offend anybody, but um, you know, it can, there, there's some misinformation out there um, that dreams are, you know, messages, you know, from beyond and all of these things. Hey, I'm, I'm a scientist. I can't say that that's true or not. But what I can tell you is that they're windows to your unconscious. And if you want to get an idea, if you really want to know yourself, really know yourself, like, like deep, deep, deep level, the dreams are where it's at for that. Um, so getting people together and, and kind of teaching them a more scientific way um, to do dream work, um, still kind of keeping the fun, the fun Jungian like shadow work as part of it. Um, you know, uh, you're constantly working on um, uniting these different uh, disparate parts of yourself to become a more whole person. Um, and the dreams are this route to that. That's awesome. Yeah, I would love to to see that like a mastermind or a big workshop with a bunch of people kind of because I, I imagine something something like that, you'd probably end up having people help each other, you know, during exactly. the whole thing. Um, oh, the group would run itself. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Easy money, right? <laughs> uh, so if anyone is looking into studying uh, your the type of work that you're into or, you know, just some stuff you watching on TV, like do you have any recommendations for anybody? Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, have you seen on Netflix? There's a little uh, mini series called The Mind Explained. It's 20 minute episodes, and the four episodes I told I told my family who you know they they try to understand my work, uh, and so you know I do my best to try and explain it to them. And I'm like, hey, you know, if you want to understand my work on on a on a deeper level than what I've you know been able to verbalize watch these four episodes the first one is on memory the second one is on dreams um, and then they have one on anxiety and meditation so it's 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 as though you know this I mean it's really the perfect mini series did you and Jay, um, so did you and Jay have something to do with that no, surprisingly, I was, but I, everybody that popped up on the screen, I was like, oh my gosh, I know that person, you know, Richie Davidson is on there and um, Bob Stickgold, who I just talked about the Tetris studies, he's on there. Um, everybody that I cited heavily in my dissertation, is, <laughs> they must have just like gone through, you know, the, the, the list. Um, so that one's a really good one for like a primer on, um, you know, memory and dreams. Um, I really like their episode on dreams because it puts to rest a lot of the um, misinformation that I was discussing earlier um, that kind of makes people think oh, that dreams are just, you know, they're, they're in one of two camps. Either they think that dreams are like premonitions of the future and like communications from God, or, you know, they're in this camp that dreams are like meaningless garbage, right? And so it's actually somewhere in the middle. It's, it's uh, you know, our, our, as I said before, um, you know, a window into how our brain is taking the experiences from the day and making sense of them. Um, so that would be um, something that I would recommend. Also, that podcast that got me started, uh, it's um, Radio Lab. It's their episode on sleep. It's absolutely um, riveting. You know, just I, I've listened to it several times and I always get something new from it. Awesome. So the mind explained. I've been seeing that in my feed and I'm like, I should probably watch that. But I think I'm going to watch Inside the Mind of Bill Gates first. <laughs> 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 so I'm, I'm working my way down the list but it did look awesome it, it looked like they did yeah. a good job visualizing all the stuff too so yes um, cool so let's get into some audience q a guys if you have any questions now's uh, a good time to throw them in but uh, we've got a few so what traits should a person have to be a good counselor a good counselor um uh let's see Strong, I would say number one, um, strong boundaries, you know, not, not taking things personally. And this is, you know, obviously um, from, <laughs> from the horrible experience that I had um, with it. Uh, empathy, obviously, um, but here we go. We're towing a very fine line here because you need to be able to merge with what the person is saying and feel empathy um, for, you know, uh, for their, their condition. Um, but not so much that it starts to affect you. And here's what I have since done um, in becoming a coach, uh, and I actually accomplished this to a certain degree, 
prior to even making the decision to become a coach, um, and this is a life lesson for anybody, uh, which is, you know, uh, learning strong boundaries. And the way that we do that, it's not about putting up walls. It's not about holding grudges. Um, it's not about imprisoning yourself, right? And keeping people out. What it is, is actually going inward to yourself and asking yourself what needs to be healed. And once you do that, once you sit with your own pain, then now you're able to sit with somebody else in that pain. Um, I think what made me a really bad counselor was that I was so used to, I was doing what my clients were doing and I was so used to um, not sitting with my pain. Ah, that's scary. Like we do everything in this society to numb pain. Uh, especially emotional pain, that is just unacceptable. We cannot feel that. Um, so we'd actually, a lot of people don't realize that there's another way. You can sit with the pain, welcome it, become friends with it, love it, and then it doesn't, it's not as painful anymore. It just kind of, you know, dissolves. So when you have somebody that comes into your, uh, your orbit with a similar pain, you're not, you know, uh, pushing that person away. You're not blaming that person. You're not triggered by that person and you're not taking their pain on anymore because, Hey, I've learned, I've learned to deal with this and now I'm able to be present with somebody while they're dealing with it. Awesome. Um, so you mentioned earlier how someone with a good job and money was still unhappy. What advice do you give to people in that situation? If they, um, are making money in a job, but they're still unhappy. Mm -hmm. Um, my advice is, uh, you know, do a values check, right? What is it that you love about your job? For me, what I loved about my job is the opportunity to be creative, um, what I loved about my job was the interactions that I was having with people. Um, what I loved about, uh, about my research job was that I could bring curiosity. Um, now I can do those things in a different position. Um, and one that has much fewer of the crap that I don't like. So for instance, I do not like the academic publishing process. There are people who love it or there are people who can endure it. I just, I, I can't, I just can't. Like I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a great writer and I can take criticism, but I just find the process tedious. It's totally necessary. And I love that other people are doing it. It's just not for me. So for me to be an academic where, you know, 75% of the time, that's what I'm doing. That's obviously not a good fit. So if you can take, you know, the, you can assess your values. And this is something that I do with my clients. I have a, que a values uh, exercise questionnaire that we can do. And also looking into your dreams, your dreams will tell you what you value. Um, you know, I had a dream, it's gonna sound really far-fetched, but I had a dream that I installed my own washer and dryer. And, um, and my old boss uh, uh, was, was uh, getting in my way all the time. Well, what I realized from that was that I never felt self-sufficient at my job. And when I installed that washer and dryer, it was like, yeah, like I can do this. But my, you know, previous employer never gave me that sense of accomplishment. Um, so it was really important to me to, to feel self-sufficient and to have, you know, either be my own boss, which is where I'm at now, um, or have, you know, somebody who was going to support me in that. Awesome. Did you get the washer and dryer installed? Oh, yeah, awesome. I did. <laughs> All right. So does deja vu have anything to do with changes in memory or what is it? I guess is what they're trying to say. You know, um, okay. Let's go down that rabbit hole. Um, Deja vu, uh, we think is just kind of um, uh, not a glitch in the matrix, although it can totally feel that way. Um, but basically, there's a familiarity response to something when it's not familiar. Um, now, I think to understand deja vu, um, you have to have an understanding um, of the nature of, you know, memory, uh, which is um, difficult because we, we don't actually even have that much of uh, knowledge of how memory is even stored in the brain or how consciousness is created, right? So, um, but I think that uh, it's, it's a misfiring in which, um, you know, you're, you're 
perceiving something as familiar when it's not. Now, dreams, um, it's, it's fascinating because one of the things that memory, um, this process of memory reactivation is, is um, it's a process by which we're able to do like prediction error, right? So if I see something and I've seen it before, I know how to respond, the prediction error is low. Um, if I see something I've never seen before, I'm surprised, I don't know how to deal with that. And we wanna lessen the likelihood of that happening. So we want to make predictions during sleep usually um, the brain can make predictions um, as to, given the information, here are some possible things that might happen, right? We've all had predictive dreams or dreams where it's like, you know, you, you know that it's um, like the next day, maybe you have like a, a presentation and your brain kind of plays out a potential story that could happen during that presentation. Um, and then we also have those dreams that are like, oh my gosh, this totally came true. I had that dream. I predicted Jay's grandpa having a stroke two days before it happened. So the thing is, is that the brain is a prediction machine. And statistically, to take the magic out of this, statistically, it's going to be correct some of the time. We hear about the instances where it's spot on, right? Because those are the most um, interesting ones. Um, and so, you know, th what this has to do with deja vu is that it's possible that, you know, some of these things are happening in our dream world and creating a prediction error. It's creating something such that when we encounter that thing, we're not surprised. But the problem is that if we don't recall when we encountered that thing or that instance, it feels like deja vu. It feels very mysterious because we don't have anything to tie it to, but it may have to do with the dream world. Awesome. That's uh, something I've always wanted to know too. Um, so why do we forget dreams instantly usually? Um, oftentimes, so I just saw an article about this. Um, dreams are just like any other memory, okay? Memories are fragile when you first encode them. Encoding is taking what's on the outside and creating a representation of it on the inside. Um, when we first have an experience, um, there's a fragile period, and if that uh, memory isn't consolidated or strengthened within that fragile period, it's lost. So uh, a really great example of this is meeting somebody and learning their name and then immediately forgetting it. And the reason that that happens is because we have interference of new information before that, you know, the information of the name can be consolidated. Okay, so during that fragile period, usually we're like, so what do you do for a living? And how do you know so and so? And so you, your brain just get your know, system gets overloaded and it forgets. Um, the first thing due to interference. Um, and this is what happens in the morning um, when we forget a dream. So we wake up, we're like, man, I had this crazy dream. And then you're like, I'm gonna write this down, but first coffee. And you get up and you're making a cup of coffee and you know all of the information, maybe you have a conversation with your significant other or you check your Facebook, all of that is competing or interfering information that if you know that dream memory isn't consolidated immediately, and that's why we recommend that people write down their dreams as soon as they wake up, then it gets erased. And that's just, it's just the nature of memory, unfortunately. Awesome. Um, and last question, uh, does cannabis interfere with the dream process, the dream? Mm, you know, I don't know, but I can tell you that the research that I've found on cannabis and sleep, a lot of people think that it, it helps you sleep better, um, which may be true. Maybe it helps you, um, you know, sort of, uh, drift off more quickly, um, but it changes fundamentally the sleep architecture. Sleep architecture is, you know, the process by which you go through the different stages of sleep, right? So you're awake, and then you go into stage one, and then you go into stage two, and then you're in slow wave sleep, which is like 
you know, you're dead to the world sleep. And then you go into REM for a bit, that's your dreaming sleep. And then maybe you're in stage two, which is a lighter stage of sleep for a while. And then you go into slow wave sleep, right? So that's your sleep architecture. Now, um, a lot of people think that they, you know, they sleep better um, uh, using cannabis, but I believe what happens is it actually um, makes you, uh, it's less likely for you to go into that deeper, you know, dead to the world, slow wave sleep. And you just kind of hang out in stage two, um, which is a lighter stage of sleep. Now, when people hang out in stage two and get lighter sleep, it's easier to wake them up, right? So you're gonna be like more likely to, to be awoken by sounds um, or thoughts or anxiety, um, you know, subtle shifts in the room, your bed partner, things like that. So it's more likely for you to have fragmented sleep, meaning that you're waking up a lot um, and going back to sleep. And you'll be less likely to go into those deeper stages of sleep. So I know that that's true. Um, but I believe that the study, you'll have to uh, fact check me on it. The study said that it doesn't affect your dreaming sleep or your REM sleep. Um, I haven't seen anything that names cannabis as a, a, a supplement or an herb or um, you know something that you take to uh, uh, increase uh, dreaming vividness or dream frequency. You know, valerian root is one that definitely, definitely does. Um, you know, there are a, a lot of other ones. Vitamin B um, influences dream frequency and vividness, uh, but I've never seen cannabis on that list. Hmm. Awesome. Well, so uh, we're going to wrap up here. I know we had a couple more questions, but I'll go ahead and let you get out of here. Um, so where can people find more about you and, and anything else that you have going on? Yeah. Um, if people have more questions, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me on Facebook. Um, my handle is Natalie B. PhD. Um, you can find me uh, also on my website, um, carpe-dream.com. Um, and, uh, you know, reach out to me. There's information on how you can contact me on there. Um, I honestly, I'm one of those weird people that loves to talk about dreams. Um, so I will listen to you when you have that weird, crazy dream that everybody's just totally like spacing out when you tell them about it. No, I'm the person that absolutely loves um, to hear about those. So, uh, yeah, reach out. You can learn more about my services on my website. Um, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Awesome. Well, I'll let you go, but I do want you and Dr. J to come back together. I think that would be fun. Oh, that would be amazing. I would love that. Yeah, and, and since we got the get to know you's out of the way, we can just dive right into some really fun stuff and see what dive we Dive right do. into the science. Or, or we could play the newlywed game. I've always wanted to do that with him because I think we would actually do really well. <laughs> All right. We'll have to do that. So next time it, it's, it's planned. I'm going to harass him until he agrees to it. <laughs> All right. Now, well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure having you on and we will see you again very soon. I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Corn. Corn. Corn.